chapter 3. We're reading this afternoon verses 1 through 9. Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 through 9. And if we may stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Y'all will forgive me for oh, having to stop and take water once in a while. But as you know, I have a problem with dehydration. So I've got to be careful. I'll tell you what, I, I found out the last time Tommy and I went up to the country, I did something that I have not been doing up until then. And that is when we got to the town, we stopped and I got a little something to eat. So when we went up to the, the property, which is five miles up the mountain, um, I worked for a couple of hours, and I still felt good. I didn't feel the least bit sick. I didn't feel the least bit worn out or nothing. I was surprised. And I told Tommy, I said, see, that's the mistake I've been making. I would eat before we'd leave Dallas, you know. And then three hours later, I'd get to the property, and I wouldn't eat, but I would immediately go to work, and I'd wind up sweating and dehydrating, and, you know, and my sugar would drop, and everything was in. And, and every time I left the property, I felt like I was about on death's door, literally. So last time, it worked out so well. I said, Let's, let me try that formula this time and see if it works out. So we ate before we left Dallas. We got up there, we ate something, and then I worked a few hours, and I sweat like a mule, but I kept drinking water, and uh, I brought some of that Gatorade stuff, you know, and I drank a bottle of the Gatorade, and uh, I had a bottle of orange juice to get my sugar up. And do you know what, Martin? When I left that place, I felt every bit as good as when I got there. So I said, well, praise God, at least I finally figured out the formula, you know, for how to do what I need to do without feeling like I was going to drop dead doing it. <laughs> Amen. See, it's just the preacher's ignorance and stupidity that gets him in trouble. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. We stand in honor of the reading of God's word. And the King James text today reads, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, Hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden, in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Amen. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, Where art thou? Hallelujah. If you bow your heads with me one moment, King Jesus, lover of men's souls. How we love you today, God. How we thank you for the wonderful presence, a, pre a precious visitation of the Holy Ghost that we feel today in the house of the Lord. Surely, God, you have honored your word where two or more are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. We know, God, you're here. We feel your presence. We thank you for that. Lord, we need the anointing. This preacher needs the anointing of the Holy Ghost. 
if he is to be effective in delivering and ministering the word of God. Lord, your word has power, but it only has power when it is accompanied by the anointing and the presence of a living God. Help the hearer today, Lord, to understand that this preacher is not up here delivering words of his own invention, but he is humbling himself and yielding himself and making himself available to the Holy Ghost from heaven that he might deliver a prophetic word unto the people of God, that he might deliver, thus saith the Lord, a word that will bring healing and health and restoration and salvation to the hearer. Master, today, send forth your word to heal. Send forth your word to save. Send forth your word, God, today to deliver those who are bound captive by the things of sin and unbelief. King Jesus, we're believing you, God, to use your word to accomplish mighty, mighty things. For we ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. I want to read another little portion of scripture to you today. Well, I forgot to advance that so y'all could read it. There it is. See, that's what I read. <laughs> I do that all the time. See, eventually we're going to have somebody run in a booth and they're going to make sure all that stuff gets done. Because when it's all on the preacher, I forget things. But I want to read another portion of scripture to you today. And you're probably not immediately going to see the connection between our initial passage and the passage I'm about to share with you. But you'll see the connection momentarily, I promise. In Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7, the word of God reads, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden and God had given them dominion over all things. I told you I'm going to try to stay down the boat, but you notice I tried to walk around. I, I'm going to glue myself back here so I can stay in good time today. Adam and Eve had been given dominion over all things. Everything was under their power. And I believe Eden was a far more unique environment than most of us even realize. I really do. I believe Eden was far more unique than we realize. First of all, I've told you before and I've explained it to you. I believe with all my heart Adam and Eve were spiritual beings. They were not created physically, men and women as we know men and women today. Partly because they were, they were built to be eternal. They were built to live forever. They were not designed to die. Physical bodies cannot possibly survive on planet Earth forever. It just doesn't work. It doesn't happen. But we see in the Word of God, the Bible tells us God breathed into Adam's nostrils and Adam became what? A living soul. Well, that implies to me a spiritual being. The Bible tells us, the Apostle Paul said, there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. I believe the definition of soul is a spiritual body. 
That's why the Bible tells us that the souls of men in heaven will never die. Hallelujah. They will live forever in their spiritual bodies. So I believe Adam and Eve had a different nature than everything around them. Everything around them was natural, and yet they themselves made in the image and likeness of God, who, by the way, is not a man, who, by the way, is not flesh and blood, who, by the way, is what? A spirit. The Bible tells us God is a spirit. So wouldn't it make sense that Adam and Eve were created in his image a spiritual being? Am I telling the truth? So everything around them was of a different nature than they. They were not affected by the light of the sun. They didn't know what heat was. They didn't know what cold was. They had no need of shelter. They had no need of clothing. They had no need of anything that as human beings and human bodies we require. And it is not because God put a bubble over Eden. When I was growing up as a kid, that was an explanation one of my Sunday school teachers gave. Well, God probably put a bubble over the Garden of Eden, and he controlled the environment there so they could live forever. You see, that's what happens when you try to read into Scripture rather than let Scripture simply say what Scripture says. The Bible tells us they were naked. I do not believe that meant they were without clothing. Although I think that is in effect true as well. But it meant that they were without a physical body. How do I say that? Because the Apostle Paul, again, what does the Bible tell us? We're, uh, uh, word upon word, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul said that if we are resurrected, he said, lest we be found naked. What, how, do, how does God change us after the resurrection from being found naked? He gives us a spiritual body. You follow what I'm telling you? So they were in a spiritual body, but physically that would be naked compared to everything around them. The animals had fur. The animals had skin. They did not. And when they disobeyed the voice of God and they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden of Eden at Lucifer's uh, bequest uh, they suddenly realized wait a minute it just dawned on us we are not of the same substance as the rest of the world as believers today, born again, born of the water, born of the spirit, we ought to be able to look around and say, we are not like the rest of this world. Hallelujah. We are of a different nature. We are of a different substance. We are not like we are in the world, but the Bible said we are not of the world. We ought to be able to recognize we're different than the rest of this world. And I tell them the truth now. But they looked around and they realized, oh my goodness, we do not have the same nature as the animals. We do not have the same nature as the trees. We do not have the same nature as the ground and the rocks. We do not have a substantive nature like all of these things, these natural things around us. And they sewed together clothing made out of fig leaves in an effort, now listen, to resemble their environment. Doesn't that make sense? You're in the garden. Mm -hmm. All these plants, what do they have? They have leaves. They're covered with leaves. So what, is, what does Adam and Eve do? Is they work on cover ourselves with leaves. The Bible tells us that in the cool of the day, God used to come. And he would spend time with Adam during the cool of the day. And this day, God came, as he often did, and he calls out for Adam and Eve, and he says, Where art thou? <laughs> you know, it's funny, but when we do something wrong, when we do something we ought not to do, when we do something we know we shouldn't do, how often do we try to hide ourselves? How often do we try to keep ourselves from standing in front of the one that we're going to have to answer to? Hello now. Oh boy, I did something. I know mom and dad are going to be mad. So I sneak into the house and I immediately rush into my bedroom and I shut the door. And I hope they didn't notice I got home yet. Hello now. Oh, I'm running late for work. Bless God, I know I should have been here on time. Ah, oh, boy, I hope the boss is at the back of the store so I can sneak in up front and he or she doesn't realize I'm running 10 minutes late. Hello now. 
It's it's nature to simply try to hide her. I'm gonna tell you, I, everybody knows me knows I'm a dog lover. I'm an animal lover, period. But I love dogs. Dogs, they'll do something wrong, and what happens when your dog does something wrong? When they tear up a bunch of paper and they leave it all over the living room, or when they start playing with something they weren't supposed to play with, all of a sudden they hear Daddy opening the door, and guess what? Fido goes into hiding. Am I telling the truth? All of a sudden you get out in the, you get in the house and you say, and you're going, Fido, Pepper, Ginger, Coco, and you're calling their name. Why? Because they're nowhere to be found. Pepper, where are you? Because when we do something we know we shouldn't have done, we oftentimes want to hide ourselves. Am I telling the truth? Amen. Do you think God did not already know what Adam and Eve had done? Do you think God is so limited in knowledge? The Bible said there's nothing that can be hid from him. So when God was calling for Adam and Eve, do you not think he knew good and well they were hiding behind that oak tree over there? Do you think he wasn't aware that they had disobeyed him in the garden? I got a grandmother, bless her heart. Well, I had a grandmother. She's passed away. My grandmother could hurt your feelings. She could say things that were hurtful and sometimes very nasty and kind of rude and obnoxious and she could be very hurtful at times. And by the time it was all said and done, you were going to be the one to have to apologize to her. Because grandma was never wrong. She was always right. Everything she said was right. Everything she did was right. If she did it or she said it, bless God, it was justified and you deserved it. it you know, you. It, she had every right to say what she said. How many of us have ever known parents or somebody who was always right and they would just hold their spot, Martin, they would just hold their place and wait for you to come around. There'd be members of the family who could be upset with them for decades. And guess what? Grandma would never move a muscle to try to reconcile with them. She would never go to them and say, maybe I misspoke. Maybe I shouldn't have said this. Maybe I should have... No, no. She'd hold her ground and say, well, I was right for having said it, bless God. Don't you know God is always right? Don't you know God ain't never been wrong a day in eternity? Don't you know God could have held his ground and said, Adam, I'll tell you what, I don't want to visit with you until you come to me and acknowledge what you've done. I'll just sit here because you know you've done wrong. If you didn't know you'd done wrong, you wouldn't be hiding on me. I'll just stand over here and wait for you to come around. Hello now. But no, instead, God was saying, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? Speak up, son. Let me know where you're at. I want to hear from you. Hello now. Oh, I want to tell you what a message of grace. Even in the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve had done the wrong thing, when they had fallen into sin and disobeyed God, listen to me now. Oh, hallelujah. This is going to make me a little Pentecostal today. God still wanted to walk with them. God still wanted to talk with them. He still wanted to fellowship with them. Things might not be the same. You ever had somebody say something or do something? And I mean, it affected you in such a way. But you didn't stop loving them. But from that day till the day they died or the day you died, things were changed. Things were different. It, it, it's not that you stopped loving them, but things were different. Do you follow what I'm telling you? I've had experiences with family members and people who would say or do something that was so hurtful and so difficult to overcome that I never stopped loving them, but it changed how I was able to interact with them. Do you follow what I'm telling you? You ever experienced that, or am I the only one in the room? Nope. All right. This was what happened with God and Adam. Things had changed, but that didn't mean that God was not still willing to visit with them. That did not mean that God was still not willing to talk to them. We read in our second passage today a parable about a shepherd who loses one of his sheep. And the Bible said he let the ninety and nine, listen, 
in the wilderness. It didn't say he left them in the fold. Oh my goodness. Said he left them in the wilderness. You know why? Because there's safety in numbers. You wonder why the church is so important to the believer's life. You wonder why God has designed that you be part of a church and you just not try to be, you know, watching Christian television and listening to Christian radio and, dare I say, watching Christian video online. But he wants you to be part of a church. Why? Because even if you're in a tough place, even if you're going through a bad experience, even if you're having a hard time, even if you're in the middle of the wilderness, there's safety in numbers. You see, those 99 that he left behind proved one thing. They proved that they could follow the shepherd. They proved they could follow the direction and the leading of the shepherd. But one somehow, some way fell away. One somehow, some way got lost. That didn't necessarily mean that that was a, a sheep who was uh, rebellious and decided, I don't want to follow the shepherd anymore. I'm not interested in following the shepherd anymore. No, he might have just been. While they were grazing, and the Lord come along, the shepherd come along and said, All right, sheep, let's go. And he rang his bell to get their attention. And most sheep, when they hear that bell, they know to follow. And they begin to follow. And that one little long sheep might have just stayed where he was, kept nibbling, wasn't paying attention, wasn't listening. I'm going to tell you, a lot of people lose out in the church of God because they, they sit there and they dawdle. They're not paying attention. You're in church. The preacher's preaching, but you're not paying attention. You're hearing everything except what the preacher's saying. Hello now. You're thinking about everything except the message that's coming. God is trying to speak to you, and you ain't hearing. Hello now. And then you wonder why that week you wind up feeling powerless. You wound up feeling defeated because you weren't following the shepherd. You lost track. You got distracted. Maybe that little sheep, Martin, as the, she as the shepherd was leading them, maybe that little sheep, uh, one of his hoofs fell into a gopher hole and he broke his little leg. Maybe he got hurt. Maybe he got wounded. And as the shepherd led, he didn't notice that that one sheep was left behind. And maybe the shepherd led the sheep in a nice area that was green with grass, but it was also fairly close to a cliff. Tommy and I, when we go up to the mountains, some of them roads, I'm going to tell you, some of them, now they've got guardrails on all the road, you know, you're not going to fall off the edge. But boy, you look over the edge, and I mean, it's quite a drop. Maybe the shepherd was leading them down a path that was a little narrow, and on one side it was a little steep, and maybe one of them little sheep lost his footing, and he fell down onto a ledge. Or he fell down onto a tree growing out of the side of the hill. And there he sat. Do you know what animals do a lot of times when they get hurt? You know what animals do a lot of times when they're dying? They'll go hide themselves. Anybody ever had a cat? And when that cat got sick, and that cat was distressed and in trouble or was dying... What do they do, Martin? They hide themselves. You'll be searching all over the place trying to find that cat. You'll be searching all over the place trying to figure out where your little baby went to. And because it's in trouble, because it's experiencing sickness or disease or it's near death, it has decided to conceal itself. Well, I've got news for you. Maybe that lost sheep has gotten sick. Maybe that lost sheep doesn't feel well. Maybe that lost sheep is dying and decided, I'm just going to wander off and I'm going to hide myself. I don't want to hold up the rest of the pack. Are you following me so far today? See, we always think when you hear the story of, this, of the sheep that's lost, we always assume it's because he just decided to wander off. But there are many reasons a sheep can get lost. And not all of them are the sheep's fault. Some of them might be, but not all of them. But the shepherd notices, hey, I'm one short. 
And what does he do? Does he stand there and say, well, I've still got 99% of my flock, so why worry about that one? Hello now. That's what a lot of us would do. Well, bless God, I've got 99 out of 100, so that means I'm on the winning end. I haven't lost any money. I'll just stick with that. No. The Bible tells us that this shepherd in the Lord's parable went and he began to hunt and to search for that one. Pastor, what are you trying to tell me? I'll tell you what I'm trying to tell you. Whether you've sinned against God, whether you've backslidden, whether you've lost your place in your relationship with God, whether you're hurting and you're finding yourself falling away from God, whether you're sick and you feel like you can't find God. I've been sick. I've been dying in a hospital and I felt like God was a million miles away from me. I will never forget that feeling, Lisa, as long as I live. I could not for the life of me feel the presence of God. And it was a horrible feeling. It was the worst feeling of my life. I remember being on, on intubation, you know, and I remember lying in that hospital bed and for the brief moments that I would be cognizant and I'd be alert, and I thought to myself, Lord, where are you? I don't feel you. I don't feel your presence. I don't understand why. I'm in this terrible place. I'm sick. I'm dying. And I don't feel your presence. And then all of a sudden, my brother Michael had put a picture up for me in the hospital room of the Lord. I believe he was walking on the water or something in this picture. And he had put it up on the wall near the clock so I could see it without having to even turn my head. I could just look. And I looked at that picture and I thought to myself, and I began to speak to God in my mind because I was intubated. I couldn't speak through my mouth. And I said, Lord, you're here. And I know you're here. Not because I feel you, but because you said so. You said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I said, and Lord, if you said you'd never leave me nor forsake me, then I know you're here whether I feel you or not. Hallelujah. Folks, that is the nature of faith. It's not about feeling. It's not about what you're feeling. It's about taking God at his word. And I said, I know you're here because you said you'd be here. And by God, you will not under any circumstance lie. And you will not under any circumstance fail to honor your word. So I know you're here whether I feel you or not. I've got news for you today. If you're backslidden away from God, if you're sick and you feel like the presence of God is nowhere to be found, if you're hurting, if you're dying, if you're in desperate shape, God is saying, to you today, where art thou? Speak up. Speak up. I want to find you. You see, how many times do we say when we're backslidden away from God, well, you know, I haven't made the effort to find God. I haven't made the effort to uh, find the Lord. I haven't made the effort to restore my relationship with God. I haven't made the effort to get back into that place that I used to be. Honey, I've got news for you. Whether or not you made the effort is of little consequence because God is looking for you. Hallelujah! You may be hiding from him. You may be out of sight. You may be out of view. You may be backslidden sit down, but God is calling out, where art thou? I'm looking for you. Hallelujah. The shepherd looks for that one that is lost. And as he's looking, he needs that sheep to make a little noise. All he needs that sheep to do, Johnny, is ba. Uh, if he's on the side of that cliff, if he's off on the ledge somewhere, look at our, look at my illustration today. If that sheep is off on the side of a cliff and he's not immediately in the shepherd's line of vision, then the shepherd needs to hear from him. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter if you're backslidden away from God. It doesn't matter, LGBT believer, if you've walked away from your relationship with God. He's as near as the old song says, as the mention of his name. Just make a little noise. 
Let God know where you're at. He'll find you. Hallelujah. You don't have to put a whole lot of effort into finding him because he's putting a whole lot of effort into finding you. Don't you think for one minute that while you're away from God, that God is sitting up on his throne saying, I'm in the right. I ain't got nothing to apologize for. They're the one that did wrong. Hello now. I got news for you. That's the God that I was preached as a kid. How many of us had that God preached at us? I'm in the right. I'm the holy one. I'm the righteous one. You need to make things right. Well, I'm here to tell you. My Bible tells me different than that. Hallelujah. My Bible tells me that my God is the good shepherd. And the good shepherd looks for that one that is lost. Even if he has to leave the 99 others in the wilderness. My God have mercy. Think about that. Do you realize how powerful and how potent that is? That he would leave them in the wilderness, folks. He didn't find a safe spot. No. As long as they stick together, they'll be safe enough. He left them in the wilderness so he could seek out the one that was lost. Let me move forward in my message or else I'll never get done in good time today. Amen. <laughs> John chapter 10, verses 7 through 16. Then said Jesus unto them again, listen, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now listen to this, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. You have no idea what Jesus just said here. You've heard, this, you've heard this read a thousand times in your lifetime. You've heard that passage and you say, okay, he's the good shepherd. I've seen all the pictures of Jesus with the staff and he's carrying the little sheep on his back. Hallelujah. He's the good shepherd. Yep. He's the good shepherd. We sing songs about him being the good shepherd. You have no idea what Jesus has just said. I'm going to help you understand in a minute. I am the good shepherd, verse 11. The good shepherd, he repeats that title, the good shepherd, giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, listen, whose own the sheep are not. Now y'all are hearing me put emphasis on this and you're sitting there, okay. All right, I don't get it. Okay, he's emphasizing this for some reason, but I don't get it. Hang in there. I'm going to have you shouting in a minute. That is, if you feel this, you're going to shout. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sheep the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. Notice he keeps saying over and over again, I am the, he doesn't say I am the shepherd, he says I am the good shepherd. I am the Good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Listen. I am the good shepherd, verse 14. And know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. 
them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, listen, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Now, for those of you who do not understand us, one God, Jesus' name, apostolic preachers, who preach the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've tried to tell you, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Jesus had searched the scriptures, meaning the Old Testament, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. These are they which testify of me. Matthew 19, 16 through 17. And behold, <laughs> One came and said unto him, Good master. <laughs> good master. He didn't say master. He said, Good master. What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus said, Do this or do that. No, that's not what he said. And he said unto him, Listen. Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. <laughs> there is none good. He didn't even answer the man's question. He was too busy dealing with the man's language. He was too busy dealing with the words the man used. He said, why did you call me good master? Why did you put good on the front of master? Because ain't one but that's good. And that one is who? God. Are you hearing me today? Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. There is not one that's good but God. Why would he challenge this man for the use of the term good and then turn around and use it on himself and say, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Okay, God. Do you understand what I'm telling you? He said, honey, I got news for you. These sheep don't belong to somebody else. These are my sheep. Whose sheep are God's people? They're God's sheep. Jesus was not a hireling. Jesus was not somebody else beside God that God used to be the shepherd of his fold. No, he wasn't an angel that God hired to do the job. He wasn't somebody God created to do the job. He was God. Hallelujah. He said, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd layeth down his life for the sheep. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Do you get what I'm telling you now? Does that make you at least a little bit want to be Pentecostal? <laughs> Hallelujah. I am the good shepherd. He said the sheep know my voice. He said these are my sheep. Jesus didn't come, Tommy, I don't care what the Jehovah's Witness say, so that he could lead God's sheep back to God. He said, no, these are my sheep. And my sheep know my voice because I am the good shepherd and there is none good but God. Hallelujah! Woo, you get it? Psalm 23 and 1, we read the words, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord, Jehovah, is my shepherd. I shall not want. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. These are my sheep, and the sheep know my voice. Oh, my God, have mercy. We don't have two shepherds. We don't have a shepherd and a hireling. We have the shepherd. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Listen, but look at the way the Lord ends the passage I read to you in John chapter 10, verse 16. And other sheep I have. Again, again, he claims ownership of these sheep. Even the other sheep are his, right? He said, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. 
Oh, hallelujah. Why are we a one God, Jesus' name, Holy Ghost, baptized, tongue talking, Jesus' name, water baptized in church? Because there ain't but one fold and there ain't but one shepherd. And Jesus is his name. It's all in him. It's all in him. The fullness of the Godhead. It's all in him. It's all in him. It's all in him. The mighty God is Jesus. And it's all in him. He said, I am the good shepherd. Hallelujah. Tell you, you get to understanding this stuff, it'll make you want to shout a little. It'll put a jig in your feet. I'm, oh, I'm going to tell you. Listen to Jeremiah. I'm trying to finish. Listen to Jeremiah 31 and 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar so off, and say, He that scattereth Israel will gather him. And keep him as the shepherd doth his flock. So who's claiming to do the shepherding here? God is. He said the same one that scattered Israel is going to regather Israel as the shepherd gathers his flock. Now listen, finally, Ezekiel 34, 9 to 16. God speaks to the leadership of of the spiritual house of Zion, the spiritual house of Israel. And he said, Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, listen, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out <laughs> as the shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered oh my god let me read that to you again y'all gotta put on a little Pentecostal thinking cap for a minute as the shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep. Oh my God. Ooh, I want to have a tongue talking jack that lasts about 45 minutes. Are you hearing what God is saying? He said, I'm going to gather my sheep. I'm going to bring healing. I'm going to bring restoration to my sheep. How am I going to do it? I'm going to do it like a shepherd who is amongst his scattered sheep. In the day that the shepherd is amongst his scattered sheep sheep. What is that telling you? That tells you that the shepherd is going to come and be amongst his sheep. <laughs> oh my God. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Let me rephrase that. I am God your shepherd. I have come to be amongst my sheep <laughs> so that I could pull them back together, so I could bring them back to you. Listen, I'm almost done, almost done. As the shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered <coughs> in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be, there shall they lie in a good fold 
and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost, and bring again that which was driven away, <coughs> and I will bind up that which was broken, and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. So in the Old Testament, who said he was going to be the shepherd? Who was going to come down and be among his sheep so that he could do this work of restoration? Jesus said, if I be lifted up, what? I will draw all men unto me. The Lord said, I will gather them together. I will bring them together. I'm going to do the work of the shepherd. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. These sheep are not somebody else's. These sheep are mine. These sheep don't belong to somebody. I'm not working for somebody else. You see, I'm a pastor. Now, pastor is a term that literally means a shepherd. Okay, I'm a shepherd of this flock, even though it might be a pretty small flock. I'm a shepherd of this flock, but I'm still a hireling. I'm somebody that God hires. I'm somebody that God employs to do the work of caring for this flock of God. You follow what I'm saying today? Amen. So you understand today, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I'm here to tell you right now, I'm closing. See, I made pretty good time. I saw Bill. He thinks I didn't notice him. I saw Bill. He didn't look at his watch, but he I could just see the time clock in his head. He's like, I won't see how he does today. If you sinned against God, if you're backslid today, if you're away from the Lord, if you're hurting, if you've hurt yourself, if you've been pushed away, Jesus said he was not only going to scatter... Uh, uh, bring back those who have been scattered. He said, but I'm also going to bind up those that have been hurt. Hallelujah. Those who have been wounded. Remember I told you earlier in my message, there's a lot of reasons people wind up separated from the flock. Hello now. There's a lot of reasons people wind up separated from the flock. The Lord said, I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away. How many people watching us on Lying today to feel like the church, the pastor of the church they grew up in, the preacher on television, drove them out of the church, pushed them out of the church. The Lord said, honey, I'm looking for you. <laughs> I'm looking for you. I am the good shepherd. I am the God of your salvation. I am the shepherd. I'm not the one who's been hired to care for you. I'm the one that owns you. You are mine. Hallelujah to God. You belong to me. All I need you to do is make a little noise so I can find you. The Word of God tells us, people ask me all the time, how do you deal with, with things in your past that you've done? How do you deal with, you know, times you've been away from God and, and you've done some hideous things? And folks, boy, I'm going to tell you, I'm not joking when I tell you. I could, I could tell you some stories that would curl your hair and you'd probably never come back to church because you'd say, even if that fellow was backslid when he did it, I still don't want to be in this church. I've done some pretty horrendous stuff while I was away from God. Did some pretty terrible stuff. I was a lot like the prodigal son. Honey, I was living amongst the pigs. I was looking at what they feed pigs and thinking, hmm, that looks pretty good to me. I'm hungry. And I was struggling and struggling and struggling. And then finally it dawned on me in my father's house. Just because I was backslid, Martin, didn't mean he wasn't still my father. Hallelujah. Just because I was backslid and away from God didn't mean that I was still his son. What did that son do? He came home and he knocked on the door and they had to search out his father to find him because his father was out working, busy in the fields. No. No. 
The father was on the porch of the house waiting for the son to come home. The word of God said he was looking for him. Hallelujah. He was looking for him to come home. And as that son began to come up the driveway, the father ran to meet him. Hallelujah. The word of God tells us very plainly, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How do I deal with past sin? How do I deal with things I've done? I confess it to God. I said, Lord, I've done some hideous things. God, I've done some terrible things. Jesus, put it under the blood. Please, Lord, put it under the blood. I don't want to see it again. Hallelujah. One thing I, I love about the blood of Jesus, it's acidic. When you put something under the blood, it ain't there long because it winds up getting eaten up and dissolving and disappearing. Hallelujah. So what you do is, Mark, you put it under the blood and you leave it there. You confess it. Are you today in a place where you need God? You need to restore your relationship with God. You need to be saved. Are you lost today? Has sickness or disease distracted you? Has it pulled you away from the fold of safety? Can you no longer see the shepherd from where you stand? Don't think you have to search him out. He's the good shepherd. Your God is looking for you right now. All he wants you to do is make a little noise. Well, what do I say? Easy. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. Lord, I've sinned. God, I've fallen short of the glory of God. And the Lord says, that's all right. Get up on my shoulder. Let me bring you into the fold. Let me bandage your wounds. Let me help you heal. I'm here to tell you today, no matter how hurt you are, no matter how rejected you are, no matter how much people in the church have hurt you, even in the Old Testament, the shepherds didn't do their job right. Mm -hmm. And God punished them for not doing their job right. Just because you're hurting, just because you're in a bad place. Don't think for a moment that God is not able to heal. Don't think for a moment God is not able to restore. Don't believe for a moment that you cannot be reconciled to God. Oh, yes, you can. Because the good shepherd right now is saying, where art thou? Would you stand with me this afternoon?